Hi, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here with you all. So I'm a PhD student at the University of Manchester, and today I'll be giving you a bit of an overview on what I've done so far throughout my PhD by discussing the insights on the provenance of the Kalkman Creek Lunar Meteorite. So the first question is, what are we hoping to learn from this project? And the second is, what can a meteorite like Kalkalon Creek actually tell us? So by studying the sample, we're hoping to learn more about both the volcanic and impact histories of the moon. And by using lunar meteorites in, in particular, we're hoping to broaden our understanding beyond that of the sample return missions like Apollo, thanks to their more global nature. So a comprehensive geological study of the sample will give us the context within the moon and actually age dating will give us the story. <laughs> so the sample itself, Calcalon Creek, pictured here, um, is a lunar meteorite that was discovered in Western Australia by an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander me meteorite hunter, supposedly sometime in the 1960s. It's a regolith breccia with a pretty lithologically diverse array of clasps as can be seen, um, set in a glassy, highly vesicular matrix. So notably from past studies of the sample, um, it has a very enriched, it's um, an incompatible trace element enriched uh, bulk rock chemistry signature, which has led to the question, does it sample material from the near side Procellarum creep terrain, or does it sample material from the far side South Pole at Aitken Basin? both of which are geochemically similar to the meteorite from remote sensing data. So actually discerning uh, the pro meteorite's provenance will help us understand more about the region and the processes that have shaped it. So method-wise, it's kind of a two-step approach. Um, the first half is vaguely similar to what Alan just talked about. Thanks, Alan. Um, so the first, I'm doing a bit of a geological um, characterization of the sample. So I'm using a mixture of non-destructive electron beam techniques. So scanning electron microscopy, electron probe microanalysis, and Raman spectroscopy to get the geological context of the sample. And then I turned to radiometric dating. Um, so I did lead lead and uranium lead systems via secondary ion mass spectrometry to get some dates from different clasps and matrix grains within the sample. So there's the sample itself. On the left, we have a lovely little backscattered electron image with um, different clasps outlined um, in different colors based on the type. The screens might be a bit better to look at here. And then on the right, there is a false color X-ray elemental map. So this just gives a really good view of the different textures and mineralogies that we see in the sample itself. So initial characterization of the sample shows quite the diverse array of class types, which range in shape, size, lithology. These include some granophere clasps, which are outlined in pink on the left and which appear in this bright blue on the right in the false color map, along with uh, basalt clasps outlined in blue, um, highland rock clasps outlined in purple, impact heights in green, mineral fragments in orange, and then glasses outlined in yellow. So I'll actually go through some of the different class types one by one here now. Sorry. So to start off with, um, I'm starting off with the granophere class because I think they're quite interesting. They're a bit rare in the Apollo collection. We don't really see them too often, but their presence here um, it's quite fascinating because they're quite the evolved lithology. So we get these granophere clasps in the sample, and they're really characterized by these intergrowths of quartz with K feldspar and or plagioclase. Now in the sample, we kind of get two different types of granophere clasps. So on the left, um, the granophere clasp is a bit more mineralogically diverse. In addition to these intergrowths, we also get minerals like olivine and ilmenite, as well as calcium phosphates and zirconium rich phases. Meanwhile, the different granophere class on the right is a bit simpler. So it's just the intergrowths with a single marilite grain. Con, they are quite tiny. The scale bars um, in the top right is 500 microns on the left and only 50 on the right. 
So there is a bit of a scale difference there between them. So I did some lead lead dating on both of those clasps and a couple of other Grand Affair clasps in my sample. So this is the Grand Affair class from the left. Um, the lead lead isochron for this one gives us a bit of a younger isochron age at about 3.9 billion years, which we interpret to be an impact reset age. Um, go. And the one from the right has a bit of an older lead lead isochron date around 4.2, 4.3, um, which we interpret to be a minimum crystallization age and which we see actually reflected in a bunch of the other granophore clasps in the sample. So there are these two different age groups with the granophore clasps. Oh, it keeps hitting the wrong button. Moving on to the Mary basalt clasps. Um, so in Calcolon Creek, we see a pretty diverse range of mineralogies and textures as evident in the three backscattered electron images there. Uh, still, they all generally plot within very low titanium to low titanium fields based on pyroxene geochemistry, which is evident um, in the green field, which can be seen on the screens, but not up here, uh, on the right-hand plot. And I did do some lead-lead dating on these clasps as well. And generally, they plot around 3.7 billion years old, which we interpret mostly to be minimum crystallization ages. Some other components in Calcolon Creek um, include the highland rock clasps, which I mentioned. Largely, these are mostly just composed of pyroxene and plagioclase, and they largely plot within high alkali sweet fields based on their uh, magnesium and ornithite numbers. We also get uh, lots of impactite clasps. So we get both impact breccias, like the one I show here, um, as well as impact glasses. Um, the impact breccias sometimes contain clasts within clasts. There's actually a little Mary basalt clast in the bottom left of the impact type class shown there in the middle. And individual grains within the class themselves also show evidence of being impacted. So there on the right, there's a little granular zircon, which we dated. And generally, lead lead dates for different components in these clasts pump around 3.9 billion years and 4.2 billion years. Now, glass ferals have previously been unreported in Calcolon Creek. Some have even suggested that they don't exist at all. However, we did find some in our section, uh, which confirms Calcolon Creek as a regolith breccia as opposed to other types of breccia. Geochemically, they're pyroclastic and quite similar to Apollo 17 orange glasses in composition. I also dated a suite of matrix grains. So matrix grains in the sample uh, largely reflect the class mineralogies. So we get plagioclase, pyroxene, olivine, so on and so forth, with the addition of uvospinel, chromite, troilite, and iron nickel blebs. Now we dated some apatites, some merylites, and some zircons, um, two of which are shown on the left. And we have lead lead dates, which range from 3.8 to 4.3 billion years old with major clusters at 3.9, 4.1, and 4.3 billion years, which you can see in the kernel density estimate plot in the center there. So just to give a bit of a geochronology summary to get thoughts in order. So the Granifer class, we had two major age groups. So we had two main events we had an impact at that younger 3.9 billion year old age, and we had a crystallization at that 4.2, 4.3 billion year old older age. Mary Clay, the Mary Basalt class is much the same. We have that single event, that single crystallization at around 3.7 billion years old. The impactites um, represent two events generally, we have an impact at about 3.9 billion years and another at 4.2. And all of these dates and events are reflected in the matrix grains themselves too. So thus comes the question, taking it back, what is the provenance of the Calcolon Creek Lunar Meteorite? 
So this up here is a compar comparison of the sample's bulk geochemistry to the Lunar Prospector gamma ray data set, showing how probable a match is based off of uh, T-squared analysis with the highest probabilities pairing in red. There is a bit of a caveat with this method because we're comparing a very small sample to a very um, large regolith area, but it's still quite beneficial for getting an idea of the lunar meteorite's provenance. So here we can see that the red regions, um, the highest probability regions, are mostly around the Procellarum cube terrain. They're in the middle of both plots. Um, there is some around the South Pole Attican Basin, especially on the left, but there's just generally not as much. It's not as probable. So paired with the comp comparisons to remote sensing data, we see a few other things that kind of start making that story. So the clasts and other components in Calcolon Creek are both mineralog mineralogically and geochemically quite similar to those we find in the Apollo collection, as well as being geochronologically similar. So that spike of 3.9 billion year old ages is quite similar to some suggestions for the timing of the Imbrium impact. Those 4.2 billion year old age clumps are quite similar to some proposals for the near side serenititis impact, both of which are on the lunar near side there, kind of within the Procellarum creep terrain. And while the older 4.3 billion year old dates might be consistent with crater counts um, for the South Pole Atkin Basin there on the far side. They are also quite consistent with crystallization ages we see in a lot of Apollo samples, especially the Granifers. So at the end of the day, we propose that Alkalon Creek was more likely sourced from regolith surrounding the Procellarum Creek terrain. These findings tell us more not only about the regolith surrounding the Procellarum Creek terrain that isn't sampled by the return missions like Apollo, but it also helps pave the way for future provenance studies. Thank you.